got to message me and remind me. What's up, guys? Fusion Street, Fusion Teams, Wednesday night. Here we go. So, you guys remember what we've been talking about the last several weeks? No. So, the last several weeks, for, for a few weeks now, <clears throat> we've been talking about following Jesus, right? We've been talking about what it looks like to follow Jesus and, and looking at some different people who chose to follow Jesus and Jesus calling out to people saying, come, follow me. You know, what the Bible says that looks like. So, I'm curious. Have you ever met a know-it-all? Have you ever met somebody that just absolutely thinks that they know everything? You can't tell them anything because they think they already know it. You know what I'm talking about? Don't point fingers. It's not a point finger kind of time. Oh, my goodness. I wasn't expecting you to point at anybody in here. Come on, man. All right. So listen, <clears throat> we're going to shift gears here. Uh, we're still talking about following Jesus, all right? We're still going to talk about following Jesus uh, uh, over the next several weeks, but we're going to shift gears here and look at some people or groups of people who felt like they knew it all before they encountered Jesus, right? I know what's going on. I don't need any help. I don't need no stinking Savior. I got it all together, right? They knew, they knew it all. They thought they knew it all. But here's the thing is, is once they encountered Jesus, once they had the, an experience and an encounter with the living Savior, some of them remained stuck in their ways, and others responded to Jesus' invitation to come and follow him. So as we dig into this, we're going to look through some different people or groups of people over the next couple of weeks. And as we dig into this, we're going to discover how our attitudes, how my attitude, how your attitude, how our attitudes can either work against us or cause us to move closer to Jesus. We're going to check this out as Jesus invites us to know him and to follow him. So right off the bat, we're going to jump straight into it in Matthew chapter 23. Now, this is going to be a long one. I want you to stick with me here. The message isn't going to be long. What I'm about to read is long, right? Because we're going to blow through like almost this whole chapter. But I'm basically just going to read you this story about Jesus just going off on some Pharisees, okay? It's, it's, it's easier for you to get it than you know, actually hearing it than me just trying to paraphrase this one, Okay? So that's the reason we're going to read the whole thing. But it's not real long, all right? So <clears throat> Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 1. Je then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. You ever hear that saying, you know, practice what you preach? You ever know somebody who didn't practice what they preached? And that's what Jesus is saying here about the Pharisees. He said, okay, listen to what they're saying about what the law, what the word of God says, but don't act like they act because they don't practice what they actually teach. They crush, start in verse 4, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra long tassels. And they love to sit at the head of table at banquets and, and in the seats of honor in the synagogue. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. What he's saying is they like to be in the place of honor, right? They like that when they go into somebody's house for a party, they like to be set in the seat of honor. Not in the back, you know, not, not in the no-name section, but up here where everybody knows their name. When they go through the marketplace, they want everybody to call them rabbi. Oh, man, you are somebody, right? Verse 8, don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you only have one teacher, and all of you are equals, brothers and sisters. And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your father. And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you only have one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you must be a servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. Now he is just flat out calling these guys out. Hypocrites, he says. For you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves. 
and you don't let others enter in either. And what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell that you yourselves are. Blind guides, what sorrow awaits you? For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple, but that it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Blind fools, which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say that to swear by the altar is not binding. But to swear by the gifts on the altar is binding. How blind! For which is more important, the gift on the altar or the altar that makes that gift sacred? When you swear by the altar, you are swearing by it and by everything on it. And when you swear by the temple, you are swearing by it and by God who lives in it. And when you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God and by God who sits on the throne. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites! For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides, you strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What? So back in Leviticus, when, when God's laying down the law, he's talking about all these things you should not eat. You know, the, okay, you can eat these things, but don't eat those things because they're unholy, they're unclean kind of thing. Gnats and camels are both on that list of things that you weren't supposed to eat. And he's making, he's, he's making um, um, a point here. He's saying, all right, you, you will strain your water to make sure that you don't do doing that because, oh my goodness while you're sitting there just gorging yourself on this other stuff that is not holy. 25. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first wash the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead bones and all sorts of impurity. Outward, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed, and you decorate the monuments of the godly people your ancestors destroyed. Then you say, if we'd lived in the days of our ancestors, we would never have joined in killing them in killing the prophets. But in saying that, you testify against yourselves that you are indeed the, the, the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead and finish your, what your ancestors, ancestors started. Snakes, sons of vipers, how will you escape the judgment of hell? Therefore, I am sending the prophets and wise men and teachers of religious law. But you will kill some by crucifixion, and you will flog others with whips in your synagogues, chasing them from city to city. As a result, you will be held responsible for the murder of all godly people of all time, from the murder of, of righteous Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you killed in the temple between the sanctuary and the altar. I tell you the truth, this judgment will fall on this very generation. As a mouthful, wasn't it? And Jesus, he was like just like going off there, wasn't he? I mean, he was shaking a fist at the Pharisees, wasn't he? So Jesus spoke of like seven sorrows or these great distresses and troubles to the Pharisees. And he publicly denounced their wickedness. And that was a huge thing because in... Jerusalem in Israel during this time period, like the Pharisees, they were like the people who ruled everything. They were the religious leaders. But the thing is, is, is Israel was a religious nation, right? They, they were governed by the law of Moses. And these religious people, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious people, they went like way off the rails. They're way off the reservation with, with 
what God had actually told them to do. They were using this religion for their own gain instead of what was best for the people of Israel. They are doing what was best for them, even if it was hurting the people of Israel. And Jesus just sat there and called them out for it. I mean, he like went off on them and called them out for it. He called them, what do you call them? Um, um, <coughs> sons of vipers and snakes. I mean, he was just sitting there just letting them have it. And he, and he tells us the, the seven different uh, sorrows or, or troubles, right, that, that they're causing. Uh, they taught about God, but they didn't love God. They preached about God, but their followers were like childish. They were so consumed with material things. They taught that oaths made to the temple or the altar were not binding, but all sw oaths sworn by the golden decorations and gifts, those were binding. Right? Because they were, their mind was all about stuff, material stuff. They taught tithing of material goods so they could get stuff. But they didn't teach about justice and mercy and faithfulness. How to have a good relationship with God and with people. It was all about bringing stuff to them. They taught about making sure that you look good in front of other people by fronting or, or putting on a mask to hide who you really are on the inside but neglected cleaning out the inside, their, their, their greed and, and their self-indulgences. They preached about keeping the law, but had hearts full of hypocrisy and lawlessness themselves. They highly valued the old dead prophets and wailed about their deaths, but they themselves are just like the people who murdered the prophets. So in these statements, Jesus highlights the unethical and unmerciful behaviors of of fake religion of the Pharisees. Jesus pointed out that the differences between how he was calling his followers to live and how the religious people were actually living. The Pharisees knew a lot of rules, but they did not have authentic relationship with God. You see the difference there? And that's the reason when you hear about somebody talking about religion versus relationship, right? The most religious people in the Bible didn't have a relationship with the one that they were supposed to be following. The Pharisees wanted to just hang out with the well-educated and the highly influential and the rich people because of what they could get from them. But Jesus, but Jesus, he interacted with and, and, he, and even invited the poor and oppressed into his presence. He valued them as individuals not for what he could get from them or what they could give to his ministry. No, simply because he loved them and he wanted to have a relationship with them. So over and over in the Bible, we see this. Over and over in the Gospels, we see Jesus doing just that. Check out this one instance here in Luke chapter 18. One of these interactions here, Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. is Jesus approached Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting beside the road. When he heard the noise of a crowd going past, he asked what was happening. They told him that Jesus the Nazarene was going by. So he began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, the people in front of him yelled. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and he ordered that the man be brought to him. As the man came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, he said, I want to see. And Jesus said, all right, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see. And he followed Jesus, praising God. And all who saw it praised God too. So Luke records this moment when Jesus interacts with the blind beggar. And Jesus heard the man calling to him from the crowd. And among the chaos, Jesus asked what he wanted, and then he met his needs. The man was blind and reduced to being a street beggar. He had no influence. And, and he probably had absolutely nothing of significance that he could offer to Jesus in return. Yet he encountered Jesus. He received healing and immediately worshipped with authentic and genuine worship. What the Pharisees were doing, and what a lot of people still try to do today, 
is, is read the Bible only to substantiate and support their ideas, making the Bible fit their opinion instead of reading it to be changed and shaped into God's image. Listen, guys, understand it. It's tempting to look for scripture to support our beliefs and our opinions. And it's easier to try to find proof of our desires rather than shift our understanding of God and his ways. Choosing to follow Jesus, that's what we're talking about. Here. Choosing to follow Jesus and submitting to the need for change can be difficult. But unless we're willing to do that, we're just reflecting those know-it-all Pharisees. So Jesus compared the Pharisees to whitewashed tombs, saying that they're beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Whitewashed tombs are only pretty on the outside. It's just like it's just a band-aid covering the real problem. It's like this. It's like having a dead mouse in your house. Has anybody ever had a dead mouse in their house? Have you ever smelled the smell of a dead mouse? It's like having a dead mouse in your house and just throwing a towel over it so you don't have to see it, right? Instead of dealing with the problem, we're just going to stick a towel over it. Now you don't have to see it anymore. And occasionally walking, away, walking by and hitting it with some Lysol or Febreze so you don't have to smell it. Problem solved, right? No. The mouse is still there. Instead of taking care of the problem, you're just masking the problem. Or it's like, it's like painting over a, a mold problem in your bathroom. The fresh coat of paint doesn't kill the mold. It only covers the mold. It just hides the mold and allows the mold to continue growing underneath the paint. It doesn't take care of the problem. It's just covering the problem. The problem is still there. And that's the way the Pharisees were. They were like whitewashed tombs. And that's the way... If I'm using the Bible for my own gain, if I'm taking scripture and twisting it to make it mean what I need it to mean for my own opinion, if I am using it against people, if I am doing anything with it except for following Jesus and allowing him to change me to be more like him, to be the one who God's created me, to, to be in God's image, then I'm just like those Pharisees, those know-it-all Pharisees. The Pharisees were given the opportunity to follow Jesus. You know that some Pharisees in the Bible actually did follow Jesus. But the majority of Pharisees, they didn't. They were all given the opportunity to follow Jesus. But most of them refused because they were so wrapped up in their selfish religion. They thought they already knew it all and, and missed out on actually having a relationship with the one that they were supposed to be following all along, with the one that they were supposed to be telling others how to follow all along, with the ones that they're supposed to be pointing everybody else to. Are you pursuing an authentic relationship with Jesus? Choosing to follow him? Or are you like the whitewashed tombs in the dirty cup, looking good on the outside to hide what is really happening on the inside? you really know it all? Do you have it all together? Or do you have this great need for Jesus to fix your brokenness? Your challenge this week. Your challenge this week is to start each day with a devotion and spending time in prayer. Ask God to show you how much you need Jesus to be your Savior. And ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you as you choose to follow Jesus. Father, I love you. And I thank you so much for loving each and every one of us. Thank you so much for your great love. Thank you so much for your great love that, that knew no, absolutely knew no end, knew no bounds, you were willing to pay the highest price so that we could be restored back to relationship with you. 
you were willing to pay the highest price so that you could come and fix our brokenness. It's not a matter of will you, Jesus. The only question is will we accept it? You've already extended it. You've already given it. All we have to do is accept it. Yes, Jesus, I need you to come fix my brokenness. I want to follow you. I don't know it all. I don't have it all together. Help me, Jesus. Help me every moment of every day to choose again and again and again to choose to follow you. I love you. And I thank you so much for loving each and every one of us. It's in your precious and holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.